electronic devices at this time. Um, going straight into admin matters and reports, um, I'd like to say a few words about the National School Board Association Convention that was held in San Antonio, Texas this past weekend. Um, I attended it along with Mrs. Holtz, Ms. Riggs, and Mrs. Felton. We just arrived home late last evening and haven't had time to summarize all the workshops we attended, but we'll have summaries available to share with you at our next meeting in April. I would, however, like to commend Dr. Spence for his presentation that he gave yesterday uh, on the profile of a graduate. Um, his presentation at the convention, along with two of his colleagues from Ed Leader 21 group, was enlightening and, as usual, highlighted the innovative work that Virginia Beach has accomplished in transitioning to a 21st century learning environment. Our school board members from across the nation were able to see the work our school system is doing and looked upon Virginia Beach as a leader and role model in establishing our profile of a graduate and for 21st century learning in the classrooms. Um, and once again, our school division was looked upon with envy by other school divisions across the nation. Dr. Spence, we would love for you to share that presentation with, with, our, with this school board uh, at one of our future workshops so that the community can hear it as well. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to share mm -hmm. something about an event they've attended lately? Ms. R Mrs. Rye? Okay, as some of you know, there was a Norwegian, a group of Norwegian high school dance, folk dancers who were here in Virginia Beach for two days. They chose Hampton Roads for their spring break. And this is a group of high school students from Wisconsin. It's, a, it's actually a school activity and they pra practice first thing in the morning because they all have their other activities after school, different sports and arts and events. And I was, I happened to be at the Trantwood Elementary uh, event and I can just tell you these kids were absolutely spellbound. The fact that they were high school kids as opposed to an adult troop coming I think made such a difference but they were so engaged and they got the children engaged too and uh, they and I know they were at Old Donation and I I think SeaTac and I forget the fourth school so our thanks to the uh, the principals for uh, opening up their schools for, for this event. Ms. Riggs? That was the same group uh, that danced at the um, Old 24th Nation. Street, no, down at the oh, oceanfront for the uh, Norwegian Sister City um, uh, event on that Saturday before, too. So. Ms. Felton? Uh, no, I'm not being redundant, but I just like to mention that the Equity Council Student Showcase at Lansdowne High School was awesome. It was really great. We were well represented by students, and I was there with them. I got a chance to learn uh, Japanese. And the students were talking, the students that were there talked how they go around to some of the elementary school to teach Japanese and to get the students involved. So it was real, that was just one of the highlights, but it was so many there that was represented there. And I just want to encourage uh, board members the next time that they have one day equity council showcase, go, you'll be amazed, blow your way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Dr. Spence, we are ready for the technology update. Yeah, this is um, another one of the items that the board has brought up in past conversations about future workshop topics, and I think we're going to address a number of questions that have been raised specifically by, I know, Mr. McDonald during one previous workshop and then a couple others. Um, this will be combined or separate, but we'll follow it up with a conversation about Schoology, which is the learning management system that we're transitioning to, um, to give you a picture of what that looks like as well. So we're going to turn it over to Dr. Cashwell. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Anderson, Vice Chair McDonald, Dr. Spence, and school board members, and of course to our many guests in the audience tonight, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, as Dr. Spence said, this workshop's been designed to do a few things. One, to provide an update um, regarding where we are in regards to device implementation, our progress, and, and our timeline, and also to answer some specific questions we've received um, from board members about device management and logistics, and then also to provide an update directly from um, a few students and teachers in the schools who received Chromebooks new this year um, who have been added on to that one-to-one -one initi initiative about how um, this has helped shape the work around teaching and learning in their building, particularly as we work towards the attainment of goal two in Compass 2020. 
And as we get started in the presentation and, and uh, as we find ourselves about to wrap up, it's hard to believe the 17, 18 school year, here we are in April. Um, I'm pleased to share with you that we are on target with the timelines that we previously shared with the board um, at the launch of our strategic plan in 2015, particularly as it relates to um, Compass 2020 goal two. So we'll dive right in. So you may recall this graphic, which um, I first shared with you as we embarked on our digital learning journey in 2015, when we began to study how we could best leverage student-assigned devices to create transformative, student-centered learning experiences by launching a cohort of 11, 11 digital learning anchor schools. At that, that time, we shared that to stay on course and reach the goal outlined in Compass 2020, we'd work to learn from our anchor schools regarding the feasibility of device type, <coughs> instructional implications, and more, and then based on those lessons that we'd expand devices to our other schools through 2020. <coughs> After two learning years with our anchor schools, we were pleased to add our first phase of one-to-one -one Chromebook devices to 38 additional schools at the beginning of this school year. And the deployment has been a success based on preliminary student enrollment and based on preliminary student enrollment for next year, we are projecting that we'll be able to bring all remaining schools one-to-one um, -one for the 18-19 school year. This school year, there are a total of 52 schools that all have Chromebooks for students and staff in grades one through 12. This includes the 38 schools mentioned on the previous slide, plus several anchor schools that may originally have implemented with other devices such as Windows or Android tablets and have moved Chromebooks fully this year, plus all schools that were added after the start of this year um, as funds have become, become available. So that's how we get that number of 52. Um, we plan to be able to provide Chromebooks to 29 additional schools, as I said, bringing all of our schools one-to-one -one based on um, funding we've outlined for next school year. So as you're aware, um, with the proposed operating budget for next year, there was $2.8 million earmarked for this purpose. We also um, have some reversion money earmarked for this, as well as a bit in a CIP instructional technology count, and then there's an SOL tech grant that um, we leverage to be able to continue to fund this and other technology needs. Um, with the Chromebooks, there is a three-year replacement cycle, as has been the past, has been in the past, even before we moved to Chromebooks and one-to-one. -one, anytime you're bringing in devices, and we've had a large number in our schools um, to date at that about 1.6 to 1 ratio for students, they need to be replaced on a regular basis. And so, um, to standardize that, the Department of Technology has worked to be able to continue to fund um, a three-year replacement cycle on the Chromebooks, um, and that annual cost is shown on the screen. Some had asked about how repair costs were handled for devices and how often they um, might break. As um, repairs have been needed to be made, typically it's not the replacement of the entire Chromebook. It's things like um, maybe the screen or a keyboard or something of that nature. And so um, if, if repairs are needed to be made before device cycles out, we do handle those. Um, and so to date, costs for this year have been approximately $300,000, but we're gonna get into this a bit later, but note while some of that comes from um, DOT budget that's on hand for device repairs, as it always has been, um, should the d um, damage to a device be intentional or caused by a student due to negligence or damage, that um, is rolled into the cost. All right. <clears throat> All right. So before Chromebooks arrive in school buildings, central staff from the Department of Technology and Teaching and Learning work collaboratively with school administrators, their instructional technology specialists, and TSTs to make sure that schools are both ready and supported. DOT staff meets with school teams to discuss logistics and make decisions <coughs> that may be based on individual school needs. Professional learning for staff is made available both centrally and at individual school sites, and schools are provided a two toolkit, which is pretty neat, via a Google site that was actually put together with best practices from our anchor schools as well as from our ITC staff. So schools can really customize the tools to meet their needs um, as they work with their staff and students on bringing the devices in. In fact, there are some device um, orientation activities for students that are pretty fun. You might have noticed at the beginning of the school year, if you follow some of the Twitter feeds from our schools. They had neat scavenger hunts where schools, uh, where students came up with their device at the end after they had 
um, gone through procedures and rules and those kinds of things in a fun manner to get acquainted with their device. You also may have noted um, several parent engagement nights held, not just at the start of the school year, but during the school year where students were able to have their parents come and sit by side, side by side with them and engage in some of the learning and experience what it's like um, to work in the classroom where devices are present. So we have a whole toolkit for schools as they bring those um, devices on board. All right, so as mentioned previously, the devices are provided for students and teachers in grades one through 12. For students in grades one through four, charging carts are provided as a means to store and charge the devices which remain at school. For students in grades <laughs> five through 12, they're provided with a case so that the device can be easily and safely carried between home and school and um, you know, not only is it easier to transport that way, it also has identifying information that's property of the school division and so forth, should it be misplaced. Um, so some have also asked um, what happens when updates need to go to those machines? Does it disrupt instruction and that sort of thing? If you're familiar with how Windows updates have worked in the past, you might be thinking um, that that's a long drawn out process, which typically we would handle during the summer. Um, but Chrome sets, sends out updates um, about every six weeks. And once the update's approved by DOT, it's released to schools and installed in a random pattern over two weeks. It's very quick and seamless and, it, and it's not caused any sort of disruption disruption um, to use of the devices. So it happens in the background and there's little impact to instruction. Um, also Chrome, the Chrome operating system is designed to work without any additional um, virus or <coughs> malware protection. Just as when our students accept textbooks and graphing calculators or other division property at the beginning of the school year, there are associated responsibilities. Parents sign a parent acknowledgement form included in the documents that go home at the beginning of the school year um, that acknowledges their understanding of the device, the digital device agreement that's included. This device agreement outlines parent responsibilities and student responsibilities for ensuring the device is used properly and in accordance with the division's acceptable use policy, um, which falls under the VBCPS student code of conduct. So this agreement makes it clear that students may be assessed a fee for intentional or negligent damage, tampering, as well as loss or theft. Should it be determined that a fee is to be assessed, there are standard charges in place for the device and various components. Principals work with their staff, the assistant principals, um, the technology support technician to determine the cause of damage and whether or not a fee would be assessed. And again, it's a standard fee. So if it's something related to the keyboard, it's about $26. If it's a screen, it's, it's a $50 charge and so forth. Um, or if it's the cost of the en entire Chromebook. So some have asked if providing devices to students puts an undue potential financial responsibility on students' families. This chart shows the typical financial responsibility taken on by students prior to the one-to-one -one, one -to -one device scenario that, and then compared to now. So I'd like you to note that there's not a significant difference in the potential responsibility in the case of damage or loss of school division property. In fact, textbook loss is pretty common. In fact, it's very common. <laughs> and the loss of Chromebooks has not proven to be so much. In fact, in the rare cases that <coughs> Chromebooks have been lost, they're quickly turned in mm -hmm. um, if someone notices them. And again, um, the cases have I, you know, returned to our property of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And, and in cases where students have misplaced them, we've been able to reunite them with their devices very quickly, unlike the old AP Human Geography book that might have been tossed somewhere. But you can see the cost of that AP yeah. Human Geography book is $115 and that of course um, that fee for the lost book would then also have been passed on to the student so um, you can see the difference in the potential financial responsibility maybe even a little lower now um, in that what we're asking our students to take on with the elimination of hard copy textbooks in some of the core areas now of course students still do take on the responsibility of those um, textbooks as well as any other material graphing calculators um, and that sort of thing. All right, according to one of our recent anchor school surveys, about 85% of our students reported that they have access at home. However, we know that access at home is still a barrier for many of our students. Schools have been creative in offering before and after school time for students in their libraries to accommodate their needs. Um, but that said, we've still been actively working to ensure that all students will have the access they need when they need it. 
Uh, we will be partnering with the city libraries for this upcoming school year. All of the libraries will be offering um, hotspot devices for checkout and we'll give um, particular, um, you know, I'll just say, I don't know what the word is. Um, they'll have first preference or priority, the students, um, in being able to check them out as they're available, because I'm sure they'll be a hot commodity in the community as well, but that's part of the partnership we've arranged with the libraries is that our students be given priority, um, even though they may not be able to make guarantee. And then we'll continue to work with the libraries to see what the need might be in various libraries throughout the city. But in addition to that, you may recall that um, as we brought forward our proposal for the Title IV grant and even our Title I grants that you all have approved, we had mentioned within those grants that we would use some of that money to secure funding for hotspot checkouts that would be at certain schools where there's highest need. So for example, certain school communities we know have a much higher need for the hotspots and we wouldn't want them to solely have to rely on the library as a means of checkout. So um, we hope to have those purchased by this spring um, and test within those schools a process for checkout. And it's the same kind of thing like when they're checking out a device at school division property they would be responsible for, but they would be able to check that out. Um, and then return it to the school. And, and of course, there are some limitations on the way those hotspots work, but um, that way we'll have a, a, an opportunity for students to be able to check out right at school. And so that again will come from our Title I and our Title IV funding. And then we have also um, known, many of us have heard about the city working with wildfire to potentially look at establishing free Wi-Fi in certain neighborhoods um, throughout the city. Now, they've not given us a target date for that, but we do anticipate um, that at some time that may come into the equation. And if that were the case, we'd simply redistribute the devices we purchased. So the wildfire, even if it were to come into place, would only accommodate certain neighborhoods in and that would mean we still have um, students across all of our schools who, who may need those um, hot spots. So we are certainly working to make sure that as we go into next school year, there would be an opportunity either at the school, at the library, or through potentially the city's wildfire that every student would have um, that connection while at home. All right, so even though we, of course, explain and review acceptable use policies, as I said, in that back to school material with all of our um, students, and we make that clear to parents, we work with our students all year long as they're engaging and work with their devices to ensure that they learn how to be good digital citizens, not just related to the work that they do in school, but because we know this is an important life skill. And um, many times the way students are inter interacting not only with their school devices, but with their own personal devices, can impact um, them for life, as you're well aware. And so we want to make sure that they have a really strong handle on those digi digital citizenship skills. Um, so you might have known that on Digital Learning Day, our emphasis this year was digital citizenship. So each and every school across the division worked with their um, instructional technologies specialists to design activities that were unique to the school and got the kids really engaged in thinking about um, priorities around digital citizenship. And you can see here one classroom, they took a digital citizenship pledge that they, the students signed um, and thought about all of those attributes of being a good digital <coughs> citizen. And you're also aware of the school divisions, be social, be smart, be safe campaign, which we continue to work on um, making schools, students uh, and our community aware of, and of course, providing resources for schools to continue those conversations through the form of student created public so service announcements, and more. All right, in regard to some questions we received around data and privacy, there are procedures in place to ensure that the division exercises the utmost care regarding safeguarding student data and maintaining student data privacy in accordance with FERPA and division guidelines. Please know that the division does not enter into any contracts with um, products for applications, whether they be instructional or not, that involve data sharing that has not been approved through the school division and does not meet the FERPA requirements. We also have a student data steering committee that meets regularly to analyze any of these um, agreements that a di the division might enter upon if there's going to be student data sharing involved. So even if it meets the requirements for data sharing, we still stop and pause and the committee looks at the reason the data is being shared, why and how it's being shared um, to make sure that it's um, it's being done so in the most safe manner and that it's really there's a need to do that for instructional reasons. Um, for example, to roster students into a program and that sort of thing. Um, also, we've received questions about whether or not the camera 
um, on the Chromebooks is a violation of student privacy. Uh, the, the camera can only be accessed by the user of the device or unless the user invites someone to access it through an online application. And the default setting on the Chromebooks is such that no one can access it unless that setting were to be changed. And if the user wanted to, you could disable the camera altogether um, while using that device. All right. All devices are filtered in school and at home, and I'm talking about a BBCPS issued device. That Chromebook is filtered at home and at school. Um, Content Keeper is the filtering system that's used while it's in school, and Securely is the filtering system we use. It's just installed on the device so that it's being filtered at home. And this filtering is done in accordance with the Children's Internet Protection Act, or SIPA as it's known, and meets those requirements. Um, if there are, you know, a lot of times staff members will tell us they've received a block or a yellow screen when kids are doing things that are very appropriate. Sometimes the filters over filter for us and then staff members may contact us and we have a process that involves teaching and learning working in conjunction with the Department of Technology to determine if a site should be unblocked for educational um, purposes. So um, the, the division also blocks gaming sites. We've tightened that up quite a bit because there were some gaming sites that were able to be accessed. The content was not um, it's such that it was a violation of SIPA, but it may have been something that was violent in nature or that sort of thing, or was just not appropriate for school use. So all gaming sites are blocked unless it's an educational game. We're also um, pleased to be field testing. DOT is working to field test a product through Securely um, that comes with our at-home filtering and in-school filtering on the device to allow parents to sign in to receive updates on their child's browsing <coughs> history. And I'll, I'll give, you, give you a peek about what that looks like in just a minute. Um, and then also to apply additioning, additional filtering while the student's at home with the device. So we'll be um, field testing that in four schools this spring and hope to roll that out to all schools next year. So here's a look at what parents would be able to see. They would receive a report. There's a site they can log into, and I believe it's also a regular daily email alert they get once they sign in. They'd be able to see the sites their child has visited, the educational sites, search words, and videos. So here is a sample report from a student. Um, and this actually comes out on one page, but you can see this, this student visited these sites that are on the left. So Kahoot, which is an educational tool, Google, ESPN. BBCPS and a calculator and so this might spark a conversation between a parent and student wondering why you know when were you accessing ESPN was that free time a study hall that kind of thing um, and then you can see the child was on two educational sites 10 marks and IXL which are curriculum related and then that would also provide search words and if any videos have been searched as well so I think that's something our parents um, may appreciate having and again it would be something they could opt into if they want if they would want to um, for our field test all right the question has also been posed if all students have devices will there be a need to replace the interactive whiteboards that are currently in our classrooms and are dying at rapid speed as you know um, and will teachers only need a classroom display monitor or will interactivity needed so as boards began dying even prior to this school year and even prior to us beginning to issue some of the one-to-one -one devices the department of technology worked to put a team together um, to work with the folks in, in our in our curriculum department to say you know are there aspects of the curriculum that require interactivity and there are quite a few lessons that are built around interactivity, particularly some of our higher um, math courses and that sort of thing that rely on some of the interactive programs that come with a SMART or a Promethean board. Um, and then they also had an open forum for teachers. DOT brought together um, a number, a range of different products that were ranged in display to interactive display and had teachers, ITSs, administrators, other staff actually um, experience them hands-on and then they were able to rate um, their preferences regarding what they needed in the classroom and so the results of that and the preference indicated that they did want some interactivity on the larger display not just with individual students so at that time DOT did make plans to identify a model that as things began to break they would use 
um, of course, as funds were available, um, that designated model to make replacements. But of course, as we move forward with the one-to-one -one initiative, we'll continue to evaluate whether that's really the right path to go. Um, if not, whether there may be the ability to use um, some applications to do screen mirroring so that you may just interact on your device. And then that interactivity that teachers are looking for <coughs> remains, but without having to invest in the interactivity on the screen itself. So while the previous slides were all really related to logistical information around the deployment of devices, again, I, I circle us back to the purpose um, of what we are looking to achieve with the devices in the classroom and how we're really looking to help um, transform the instructional experiences for our students so that, again, they're student-centered, uh, we're providing flexibility and differentiation regarding student needs academically. Um, and really improving that teaching experience as it's laid out in um, not only Compass 2020, but our teaching and learning framework, particularly, which um, calls on us to really engage students around critical thinking, communication, creativity, problem solving, those globally competitive skills, if you will. And we've really seen how um, devices really allow that to happen in the classroom in a way that it has not before. So you've heard an awful lot from me, and now I'd love for you to hear directly from some of our guests tonight. I'm so pleased to have with us um, guests from a number of schools who I'll bring up. Um, and there's a teacher and a student from three of our schools um, to, do some, to do some real, um, I guess, try to pull together for you in, in a short amount of time. Though They have an awful lot to say, and it's brilliant. So I, <laughs> I say you should get out and visit their schools if you can. Uh, but they're going to share with you a little bit about how, again, their schools received Chromebooks for the first time this year. It's made a difference. So I'm going to invite um, this teacher and student from Providence Elementary School up to share with you how this experience um, has made a difference for them. Great. Right. Good evening. Hi, I'm Fong Lin, and I'm a third grade teacher at Providence Elementary School. I'm honored to be here today to share how going one-on-one -on -one this year has transformed my classroom's learning environment. This is Providence's first year going one-on-one, -on -one with each child having a Chromebook to use in the classroom. The excitement was high, and the engagement in lessons increased compared to my previous years. A major change from going from a classroom with only seven devices to share amongst roughly 24 students to a classroom with each student with a Chromebook of their own is flexibility and choice. With 101, students have a choice to share their work in multiple different outlets, allowing them to be empowered by their work. In previous years, in order for students to get enough time on the computer, for wonderful programs like Achieve 3000, Fast Math, and 10 Marks, I had to make sure we ran a very tight schedule, and it limited the students to their digital resources because of the number of devices available. The flexibility wasn't there to let students learn at their own rate and explore what they're passionate about. Let's take Achieve 3000, for instance. Last year, students struggled to complete their articles in a timely manner due to time constraints. Now this year, students are using their personal devices to complete articles, which has increased their understanding of their reading. I'm also able to give students feedback instantly by looking at the data on Achieve to form small groups to meet the needs of my students. Another way one-to-one -one has transformed our learning is through the personal pathways design to integrate technology with our content unit. Um, the two pictures of the little girls there and the boys down there with their Chromebook um, is a picture of our most recent content unit of Simple Machines. Um, it was amazing to give students hyperdocs to guide inquiry via Google Classroom with embedded links and activities at their readiness through the data from our pre-assessments. They worked at their own pace to explore, explain, elaborate, and create something new with their knowledge. They collaborated with their peers and took their knowledge about simple machines to create something amazing. The picture with the two girls, they chose the hands-on um, performance task and they created a candy machine using simple machines. Um, that was really popular. <laughs> <laughs> and the boys down there used their Chromebook and used a program called Tinkercad, which is a 3D um, printing program, and they created a compound machine. The entire process allowed them to work on their five C's and they had to critically think about which performance tasks to complete and research. 
They communicated and collaborated with their peers and teachers to come up with something creative. It also allowed us to learn about digital citizenship and how to be safe online. Technology allows me to meet my students where they are rather than making them meet me where I'm comfortable. Another program where, that I use in my classroom is Flipgrid, which is over there with a plus sign. And I love Flipgrid. It's very interactive and it's highly engaging. And one way I used it um, this year is with reading fluency using poems. The students in that particular frame with the little snow hat um, at the beginning of the year really struggled with speaking in front of other students and with confidence and with fluency. So I introduced Flip Grid to allow her to hear herself as she read and she was able to build her confidence to show how well reading a poem over and over can really build her fluency. And I can proudly say that right before spring break, we finished our poetry unit and she stood tall and proud as she recited a poem in front of the whole class. And with the little document right there, that's a, a screenshot of a student's Google Doc. We worked through the entire writing process and it started on paper and ended on the computer. Within the Google Doc, the, it allowed the students to share their work and give immediate feedback in this comment section. It allowed for peer review to be instantaneous by fellow classmates as well as myself. And these are just some examples of the amazing work we've done this year to help um, with the help of our Chromebooks and the support for our administration, ITS, and LMS. Without it and them, we wouldn't have been able to do all these fantastic activities. It truly has transformed my teaching and their learning. And I would like to introduce you to my student, Michael. <laughs> Hello, my name is Michael Jarvis. I am in third grade in Miss One's class at Providence Elementary School. I am here to tell you how having my own Chromebook changed the way I learned in my classroom. In second grade, there was only seven computers and we had it in stations. In second grade, we went on fast math, press kids, and 10 marks. Now in third grade, I can do a lot more with all the apps. This one has mustard and pickles for language arts stations, which means you must do required activities, and then when you're done, you can pick what you want to do. Of course, it has to be school appropriate. <laughs> of course. I have more time to do a peeve, coding, and all the awesome stuff. Clever is a portal that allows us to log into many different programs to achieve encoding. With my own device, I only have to log in once and it saves my work. Unlike in second grade, you have to type our usernames and passwords every time we have to log in. <laughs> Sometimes other students wouldn't log out and it would take more time to get onto the computer. Now on my own Chromebook, I only sign up with my used password and it allows me to use my time wisely. One program in Clever is Achieve. We use Achieve to read art to read articles and then answer questions about the articles. This helps us to become better readers because we have to remember what we have read to answer the questions correctly. Hour of Code is a program that teaches us how to code. Coding is programming a computer telling me what to do. It also teaches us how codes work. Coding can be used to make games and give computers directions. I designed the game in the object of the game to catch Earth as a purple outer space. I also use a section of Hour of Code called Artist make a tiny person draw lines and, then, and I was able to make him turn by measuring with degrees. Google Docs lets us type documents and reports on our Chromebooks. We can send our work to anyone in our class or to our teacher like an email. Our class uses Google Classroom to post websites, hyperdocs, projects, and surveys. I design many websites to share with my class. We included a Dark Dig website, an Ancient Greece website, a Blue Crab website, a Tip to Game website, and a website explaining how to make a website. I want to make websites because I like to make topics and share what I find in my class. In conclusion, having my own Chromebook in school this year has been great because it has allowed me to explore great new products of my choice. I now have access to all the things I told you about and more.
Thank you for letting me share how awesome my Chromebook is. <laughs> Here's my car where you can check out some of my websites. Oh, oh there you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to ask, what, what are the yeah, conflict of interest about Howard? He was thinking the same, you got to fight Joel first. So you Michael, I need you to work for me. Where's Pam? Guys, our elementary guests are actually the first time from Plaza Middle School. I apologize, I advanced the slide too quickly. So I'll invite you up to the podium. Talk about the entrepreneur. <laughs> Wonderful job. <laughs> Tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Catherine Gribble Doyle, and I am seventh grade English teacher at Plaza Middle School. And thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to share with you what we have been doing this year with our Chromebooks. Um, the first item I'm going to talk to you about is Flipgrid, which I'm also using, and I'm excited that they're going to know how to use it when they come to middle school. <laughs> um, this. The ability to use Chromebooks has just changed the classroom tremendously. Um, Flipgrid um, allowed us to film persuasive speeches and students were challenged to persuade their peers in 90 seconds. In the past, I would have had to coordinate with our technology department and I would have had to coordinate with other teachers. Not anymore. Students were able to take their Chromebooks home, record their persuasive speeches outside of school, and then also offer feedback to their peers. So they didn't even have to wait to, till the next day to come in and see their peers' videos. They had a form on Google Classroom, and that night they were able to provide each other feedback and see it instantaneously, which is just tremendous, because in the past they would have had to wait for me to collect it all and then redistribute it, and that's just not the case anymore. The next item I'd like to talk to you about is Peer Deck. And that is located in the blue um, square there. And Peer Deck has incredible features. I can use it whole class, or I can turn on a student self-paced um, feature of this program, which really changes student engagement. When I turn on student self-paced, I then, as an educator, am able to go around and really see how students are using how they are progressing towards mastery on a concept. And at the end of the day, all of this information is saved for me. I can then go review the data, use it to plan future lessons, and specifically for this, I used it to plan um, small group activities for students because we were working on thesis statements. This took me maybe 20 minutes to look at all of that data, opposed to um, collecting all of the paper and oopsies, I took it with me. So it was all right there with me. The next item I'm gonna talk about is in the gray square, and that is um, Gubrick and Doctopus, which I use within Google Docs. And in the wonderful world of English, we write a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and I used to swim in a sea of papers. I was that lady who would take her little rolly carp out to the car and take it home with me, always fearful that I would misplace something and it wouldn't get it back to the students. It would take me days, sometimes more than a week, to get students back their paper. When a student takes the time to write a wonderful essay, I want to make sure I provide them with meaningful feedback. And not just meaningful feedback, but timely feedback. So what has changed this year? Timely. I am now able to give students feedback in a quick manner so that they can build on their skill sets. The last item I'm going to talk about is um, also um, our website. So we have also used Google Sites. And at the beginning of the year, we really talked about personalized learning. We talked about student agency, pathways, and I challenged myself to, to create a way for students to all um, publish their work. And in the writing process, the last step is publishing. And in the past, before we were able to use this type of technology, we considered turning into your teacher publishing, but not anymore. And I'm proud to say that every single one of my students has created a digital, a digital portfolio. They have published their work. And it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop when they leave my English classroom. I collaborated with my peers, so now that they're also publishing their work from their science classroom, they're publishing work from math, from their electives. 
And while I'm in seventh grade, it's important to talk about eighth grade as well. Um, so I've already started to coordinate with the eighth grade English teachers. So by the time that these students go to high school, they're going to have a robust portfolio. So we're very excited. And thank you so much for this opportunity and for all this wonderful technology. And I'd love to introduce my amazing student, Caitlin Mouse, and she's going to talk about her experience. Hello, my name is Caitlin Mounts, and I attend Plaza Middle as a seventh grader. Today, I will be speaking about my journey with technology in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Two years ago, I was in fifth grade, and my elementary school, Kingston, had just become a digital anchor school. I was assigned a Chromebook along with every other fifth grade student, but they are to be used at school only, so I could not take them home and work on digital assignments outside of school. Last year, I had minimal access to technology as a sixth grader at Plaza Middle. In my social studies class, I was assigned a Chromebook, but it was shared with three other students, so I could not take it home or transfer it between the classes. Currently, as a seventh grader, I have the most access to technology I ever have. At the beginning of the year, we were each assigned a Chromebook that we would carry between classes, not have to share with anyone, and be able to take home and work on digital assignments. My first picture is a picture of my Google Drive, and that is outlined in a black frame. As I reflect on each of these years and the different amounts of access to technology, the first thing I notice is the size of my binder has decreased tremendously. <laughs> um, this is because without access to technology, paper copies of work must be printed out, which are then stored in binders. However, I now have full access to technology, so there's not a need to print out the work. Instead, I use Google Docs, Google Slides, and Google Slides to complete my work digitally, which then all stored in my Google Drive. My second picture is a picture of my peer reviews, which are outlined in the blue frame. In addition, I have noticed some of the most impactful changes in my language arts classes. For example, without access to technology in my English class, I completed my peer reviews on printed copies of a checklist. Peer reviews are done when the class writes essays. We collaborate to give one another feedback in order to improve our essays. However, with access to the Chromebooks in every class, including language arts, I am able to do these digitally, which is very helpful because we can get that feedback from our classmates, even when we are not in class, and we get that feedback right away. My third picture is a picture of Flipgrid and the peer reviews that go with that, and those are in the orange frames. I noticed another improvement with the use of technology recently, when I was not able to be in class. I was states away, but was still able to stay caught up with the unit we are focusing on in English because everything that I needed to stay engaged was posted on Google Classroom. For example, one of our assignments was to use Flipgrid to record speech. I was able to do this assignment and post it for my classmates to view even though I wasn't in class. My final picture is a picture of the World of 7 Billion website and that is in the gray frame. Lastly, the access to my Chromebook made it possible for me to enter a national contest called World of 7 Billion. The process of entering the contest include conducting research, recording a video, and submitting digitally. Since the only way to enter the competition was by turning in a digital file, I would not have been able to do so without the access to technology. In conclusion, I would like to thank the school board for providing me with a Chromebook as it has benefited my educational career in many ways. Mm -hmm. Next up. from Princess Anne High School. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Christina Burney. I'm a social studies teacher at excuse me, Princess Anne High School. Um, so as a social studies teacher, um, we have the Chromebook carts, um, but even going from just the Chromebook carts to one-to-one -to -one, uh, in December this year has been amazing. Um, two big things I want to highlight in terms of that transformation. One is the amount of instructional time we've gained back. Um, the time it would take to have every kid get their Chromebook, make sure they had the right number because sometimes they did not get put back in the right one. So-and-so has my Chromebook. Oh, which number do I have? I can't remember. Um, and then also the time that would be spent putting back the Chromebooks um, and making sure they were plugged in. And especially if you run a classroom with multiple teachers, you might find, you know, I might come into the third block class expecting the Chromebooks are all charged up, ready to go. You know, they're all in their right spot. And then we start pulling them out and Someone hadn't plugged one in, and so it was dead now. And so that kind of hassle um, is no longer a problem. Um, the other big thing that the kids are, in terms of instruction, is when there was times where you might want like just a little thing with technology, maybe it was like your hook activity or something to transition, you had to kind of weigh whether it was worth taking the time to yeah. get out the Chromebooks to have yeah. to deal with putting them back, or whether, you know what, 
screw it, we'll just do something else different. <laughs> um, nowadays, uh, the other thing I would say is that the equity factor, and I actually pulled my students on Google Classroom um, to see how they felt it transformed. And what they really shared was, um, you know, the organization, the ease, the fact that they could access it when they had time. So kids were able to be productive at lunch or during study hall. Uh, more simply, you know, we used to have a big problem with getting kids to the library to access the computers during the academic support blocks. And now because the kids all have their Chromebooks on them, our library has been able to transform. Um, and they've got amazing things going on in there because they're not just having to house the kids needing to get to the technology to complete the assignments. Um, and so that's been a really positive change. The other things the kids indicated was that um, the equity factor, not just in terms of not having devices, but for families that maybe have a device, but have multiple students fighting with their peers to gain access to that home computer um, is no longer a problem. I have several sets of siblings who say now it's so much easier because you know they don't have to try to budget who's getting on when. Um, so some of the things um, I just wanted to share that we've been doing this year in terms of transforming in the classroom um, Edpuzzle, um, what I love about Edpuzzle is versus um, the old, you know, this is where you can embed videos, you can embed questions into the videos. And what's nice with it is that I can be grading their responses as they go and as they progress. So by the end of the assignment, I know what I need to address, maybe as a whole group or who I need to pull aside and maybe talk with. I can type in that feedback directly to them and versus having to collect the papers, grade them that afternoon, and then maybe address something the next block. So very timely feedback, instantaneous, both in terms of directly what they're doing, but also what do I need to remediate immediately. Um, one of the fun things we're looking at now uh, in the red box, you'll see the World uh, History Digital Breakout. With our World History One PLC, we worked this year collaboratively to create um, digital breakout, which is essentially you know like the uh, escape room puzzles, but in a digital format. And what I really liked about that was versus having, you know, like seven boxes, if you have the finances to get seven boxes put together, um, where you have kids maybe in groups of, you know, five to six, kids can do this with a partner. So they're more engaged. All of them can do it. I don't have to worry about storing all this stuff and going from one block to the next, it's already set up. Like I don't have to re, you know, shuffle everything in the room to get it set up again. So that, you know, ease of transition. Um, Padlet's been a fun one um, for student input. That's one of those things where it was like maybe that quick question hook thing that before, you know, maybe we posted things on the wall, but for them to be able to get on and see everybody's very easily from their screen. Um, the amount of collaboration, you know, kids sharing docs, Google uh, Classroom, I love. I'm actually really excited for Schoology. Um, can't wait for that training because I hear it's even better. Um, but with Google Classroom, you know, having everything there and as, you know, some of the other students share, when they're absent, and being able to keep up and have everything there, especially as an AP teacher, um, you know, we're very quick paced. And so, you know, when I have kids that are asked, it's like the notes are there, the, the assignments are there, everything is there, you can keep up on your own. Um, so for me, it's been great um, and very excited. I also will say um, going from the carts to one-to-one, -to -one, it's great not having my colleagues jealous of my ease of access to technology because um, they were still having to check out the carts from the library and trucking down the hall and things like that. And this is Nick Donato, a former student of mine, who's going to share all sorts of cool things. Hi, Hi uh, my name is Nicholas Donato, and I'm an IB student uh, and a junior at Pacent High School. And um, as you may know, Pacent is a one-to-one -one school where an English student has their own Chromebook. And this has been really helpful in teachers with lesson plans and our daily uses, and just the dynamic of school has changed overall. So we've actually developed a um, kind of, it's kind of a motto where it's, anywhere and anytime and this is very true to heart whereas you can see students right there in the hallway working in the hallway which kind of plays emphasis on anywhere um, as they can it's not only limited to the hallway and classrooms but they can go into the LMC the library um, the lunchrooms as well or um, wherever they need and at any time this can be during lunch or whatever so that really is just useful for um, teachers and students and if you look in the lower, uh, um, if you see in the center, Google Classroom, there's also a software we've actually been using, and it's actually been really helpful for both teachers and students, where for teachers, it's an organized platform where they can upload assignments and uh, grade them and also post live feedback as well as for students. And um, so it's been very helpful to keep uh, both students and teachers organized and on top of things. And I think it's going to be better with Schoology too. I'm excited for that. Um, and if you look right above that, you can see a concept map that students have been actually working on together. 
and it's a concept that of um, an English play, Macbeth, um, and what students are able to actually do is work on this and develop it as they read together in groups at, at the same time, and they can work on the same document, which is only done with the Chromebooks. This has been very helpful. So they can come on wherever and whenever, whether they're at home or in class, after they've read, they can update it, discuss, and work on the same document. And they don't need to print anything out, which also saves a lot of time and expenses. Um, and if you look right, uh, let's see. Um, if you look right at the very bottom, I'm sorry, uh, you can see that we're using Google Sites and other software. Students are able to actually post this concept map on it and publish this website and allow it to add in additional information and further analysis. And the teacher can look at this and leave comments and um, analyze this. So this has been really helpful for teachers creating new lesson plans and again publishing websites and putting their information out there. And if you look in the upper left, you can see another, again, Flipgrid, which has been very useful for teachers. And in this case, it was actually used in our biology classes, where teachers, uh, students were able to film themselves teaching uh, other students different aspects and units of the DNA uh, unit for biology, which has been really useful because students were able to use their Chromebooks, the built-in camera and the built-in mic built microphone. And that was only done with the Chromebooks. And it allows a lot more flexibility and diversity with the teacher's lessons plans, which has been really helpful um, in creating students more interested in the work because they have their own way to take and be creative and express their ideas. And at the very bottom, um, right there, you can see this is one of my personal favorites. It's Princess and Leadership Workshop, which is a really big deal at our school. And it's a three-day retreat where <coughs> students go to Triple R Ranch, and they're taught by um, other students. It's completely student-run about leadership and their experience. And as a staffer, I can personally attest to how useful these Chromebooks were. Because planning for this um, weekend is takes months and months. We actually started in the summer, and this happens in March. And throughout the entire time, every single meeting, all our staffers had opened their Chromebooks up. We were able to look in the agenda. We were able to um, create songs, skits, and dances all together at the same time, live in action. So it's been really helpful not only with workshop but with SCA as I'm vice president and it's the same thing. We all open the document, we all work together and it's very helpful knowing that we're all on the same page and we're able to update things live and make sure we're all understand what's going on. So overall this edition of Chromebooks has been extremely helpful with students and teachers and student leadership and it's made a radical change and monumental. So thank you so much for the technology. I do sort of um, from an elementary, middle, and high school perspective directly from a teacher and a student at each um, level, and then also are really excited to provide an example um, from Rosemont, El Rosemont Forest Elementary that's even going to allow you to visit the school without actually being present in the school. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, them as they introduce you to the activity and tell you a little bit about it um, as we conclude. Hi, I'm Greg Furlick. I'm a principal at Rosemont Forest Elementary School, and I have my ITS, Tina Smith, with me. And we're going to talk a little bit about how Chromebooks have changed the culture in our school over the course of this year. Uh, we, we talk a lot about student agency, and each year, throughout the year, we have to meet with our supervisors, and we update them on the progress that's going on in our school. And it's really a data-heavy meeting. We're digging into a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of talk, a lot of discussion, a lot of numbers. But I always like to find a way to end it uh, by bringing it back to the kids and, in this instance, to student agency and how Chromebooks have changed the way we do business and the way it's changed and enhanced student agency at the school level. Um, a lot of people, you've heard a lot of people talk about Google Classroom and teachers talking about the ease with which they can grade things on Google Classroom. Did you know that teachers can share their Google Classrooms with their principals, too? So I can get into a Google Classroom and look at student work. And one of the things that I've done this year with our fifth graders is we've worked a lot on goal setting. And all of our fifth graders have set academic goals and personal goals. I've been able to go into Google Classroom. I've been able to look at individual students' goals. And then I've been able to provide feedback for them right there that they get back on their Chromebooks. And that's just an example of how we're really involving our kids and getting to know our kids. Um, also, would be uh, read, should mention that all the technology you can see today, we have to thank the Education Foundation for because we got that through grant money and the, their great work. And Ms. Smith is going to take you a little bit through uh, the activities and actually take you into some of our classrooms so you can see student agency at work. All right. So instead of bringing our students to you, we thought we'd bring you to the classroom virtually. So you're going to see a viewer. Um, and in the middle of that viewer is a very faint gray dot. And that's like your mouse. 
So as you look in the viewer, you're going to look for um, a red star. That red star will explain what room you're in, the teacher, and what they're doing. This is like a viewmaster. And as you did, just like me. <laughs> and as you look around the classroom, you'll see hot spots explaining what the students are doing with their Chromebooks and with student agency as well. So feel free to turn in your chair to get a good view of the whole classroom, Very and then cool. trade with your partner because there's two different ones going around. There's a language arts and a science. And it says on the top, I believe, which yes. one you have, language arts and science. So you may want to exchange and see both. Okay, I'm going into language arts Do we look really okay. dorky right now, my <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. Welcome Please to Rosemont Please move around, look up, look down, look all around. Okay. Take, take your little gray dot and put the gray yeah, dot on, at the, on star. the dot, on the star. See the gray dot in the center? Match your, like your cursor. Right. So go in like like you're clicking, but you're not. So go take that gray dot over the star, and then it pop has a pop. I guess I turn it. Here we go over the window. Oh yeah, I just accept. Yeah, no wonder why you couldn't see anything. Right now, you should see a gray dot. Yes. Ah, gotcha. Oh, uh, now I see it. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> when it works, it's much better. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> So this was created using a 360 camera. I just snapped one shot in the classroom and a program called ThingLink, which lets me add the hotspots to those uh, to the image and turn it into a virtual reality viewer for you. Very cool. What did you have? I have language arts. I have language arts. Oh, I want to see a science oh, yes. class. Uh, we're trying to do whatever you want. Oh, excellent. Trade me. I'm not sure. We're able to take the kids to Egypt to see the pyramids, the second graders. We've taken our third graders to Greece to see the Parthenon. Um, we do all kinds of field trips. Soon I'll be using this thing link with second grade and animals. We're going to take a picture of the outside of our uh, oh, that's the thing. <laughs> our habitat outside. Just look at what animals are hidden out there using the thing link in the hot spots. <laughs> It's in front of either. Yeah. So even on a rainy day, they can be outside. Yes. Break it down to the wall. See the gray dot in that one? And that one. And now I'm stuck. Let's give that one a shot. I'm stuck. No, this is okay. so this one. Here, and there's some uh, engagement out there. You all have to be able to, I hope. I have science for all of your eyes. I know. Which is science? I thought those two activities were science. There are some more low level technology that we can afford But the Google viewers um, that are actually oh, yeah, part of or just like a lot of like purchase for all the schools and parts of our science adoption. These virtual viewers were funded through BBC. So this is not What's the price difference between that and this? Yeah, yeah. 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 But like anything, no. I think it's, 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 it's I want to get this off. I want to get that off. And then they started getting the pocket ones. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know yeah. what I did. Are you touching me? Did you break it, Beth? What? Did you touch something? I can touch. What did you do? Scientific calculators are still expensive. Oh, yeah. How much are they? You can get them on sale for around 115, but normally around 150. It's just good. 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of an elementary school and see what it's like when the students are interacting with their devices there and again creating opportunities for agency. But So before I wrap up um, this presentation, I would like once again to thank the students, mm -hmm. um, the teachers, and of course many of them are joined by families, our students. I shouldn't forget the families who allowed um, your students to be with us after school hours. Thank you. And the administrators from our schools. A round of applause. For them. Some outstanding examples, as I said, and many of these schools um, didn't even start the school year with devices. So you've heard a lot from our anchor schools who we were working with over a two-year period, um, but you had a curiosity to know how are the other schools doing when devices arrive, and you can see the transformation in, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so I think it's a testament to uh, what our teachers and administrators have been able to create in the classroom for students. So. Uh, we really appreciate their work and again um, would like to open the floor up to questions for the board regarding any other portion of the presentation as well before we transition um, again into the Schoology presentation because that is a natural progression off of again that purpose of creating not only a, an experience where students have the devices but then being able to leverage them in a way um, that provides flexibility and, and I did not even put a plug into the student or teacher who mentioned uh -huh. Schoology, but I was thankful they made a natural segue of how Schoology really um, is, is a management system that, that will streamline a lot of the examples you saw into one place and make things even easier. So look forward to sharing that next, but first would open it up to any questions. Um, I have one real quick one first. Um, I know that there is software available for teachers to have on their computers so that when students are taking a test, um, the teacher can see on their computer, for example, if a student leaves a site, leaves the site yes. and goes to another site. Mm -hmm. Is that available for all teachers or are we still uh, in the process of getting that? How, how is that? Okay. If the, if the students are logged into SchoolNet through the school division and they're taking a district managed assessment, um, mm -hmm then yes, the, that is a lockdown. The browser lockdown is present. If they're outside of that, um, for example, in Google Classroom or doing some other assessments, it's possible that that browser wouldn't be locked down. The nice thing about Schoology when you're working within that platform is that there is a, a, an ability to have that lockdown, even not in a testing environment, but depending on the activity, um, it could be when if it's a classroom assessment launched versus a district assessment launched. But so the yes, teacher would actually team, lock it down yeah, so that they I can't create, leave. If a teacher creates an assessment in SchoolNet and launches it, which is our managed assessment system, then yes, they can lock down the browser and then any of our district assessments as well. And so, okay. um, yes, that is possible and that does happen uh, when there's a specific formal assessment given. District assessment, a teacher knows he or she's giving a test or quiz they've created through, through SchoolNet and delivering it through that platform, they have that capability. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was very impressed with everybody, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. McLeod. My question is about some of the grants, uh, like for the yes. hot spots. So the question I have is, did we receive, and I know you said it was Title I and Title IV funding, yes. but are we writing those specific and sharing that this is what we want to purchase with, and therefore that is why we got the funding? Uh, yes. Yeah. So particularly, um, you might remember Title IV when that came to you. There were a number of ways that you had to, if you were asking for Title IV money, some of it had to be spent on professional development. <coughs> some was around equity, access, and opportunity. So then we would give suggested ways that we would meet that goal, um, what kind of training would be provided, what kind of resources would the money go to. And so we did receive Title I um, funding. And Title I funding um, is, again, all aimed at our Title I schools and, and has to do with creating um, situations to provide resources that um, are not resources that we have division-wide, but that are targeted to meet a specific need. And that's how we're able to leverage Title I funding for staffing and materials um, at that end. And this is a kind of scenario where this, this material is, is doing that. So yes, we um, hope to have them in place um, in the spring in those schools and be able to test um, where we have the need. Okay, thank you. Check out system. Thank you. Mrs. Manning. Um, how many of our high schools and separately how many of our middle schools are not yet one-to-one -one Chromebooks and what is the plan to make that happen, the timeline for it? The, um, the number that exactly do not have them, I can get you that. That's There's 22 schools that don't have them, of which I think 
I can't tell you exactly off the top of my head which ones are high schools and which ones are middle schools. Okay. But there are 22 that don't. They will have them this coming year okay. based on the way we've allocated for all them. High so they will all come on will. board. Yes, mm -hmm. every school that does not currently have it, minus the advanced technology, TCE, um, the adult learning center, our school sites will have them with the funding as outlined um, next school year. Okay. So, yeah, 22 currently don't have it. A majority of those um, are elementary. There are, there are one or two middle or high schools still. Thank you. Mrs. Weems? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Outstanding. And thank you, students and principals and teachers and everything. It's really overwhelming <laughs> of what you guys are doing. We, we all need to go back to school. I'm completely <laughs> lost here. But um, I went to, to several schools a few weeks ago, one week, like four or five, and and I specifically wanted to see technology at hand. And I was really impressed about how much interaction there was, even though they were on their Chromebooks. So I thought that was just very good because a lot of parents are worried that, you know, they're just going to be on a Chromebook and not be interacting. But every place that you went, there was two or three and they were working on something with the Chromebook. So that was very, very nice to see. And, um, and I really like the seesaw. Mm -hmm. um, that some of the, the yeah. um, elementaries are using where they can send stuff to their parents and the parents can get feedback right away. Um, so that That's was really, the, the, yeah, the kids were all excited about sending, mm -hmm. you know, mom or dad or grandparents, you know, what they were doing. Um, and and cl different schools I went into, of course, like some were using Seesaw and had been using it and they were all on board and some weren't because they, you know, weren't ready yet or whatever. And my question is, um, in, and even today, you know, the, the folks that we saw were young students and, and most of the presenters were younger than, than me. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> younger than many of us. So, um, and I know in different schools, you know, mm -hmm. our, our, our staff that, that have um, wisdom and, and experience on their side might not have technology as, um, you know, down pat. So what kind of support are we giving teachers that maybe technology is not their you know expertise and but they really want to learn it and and the students need to you know need to have the same opportunities as someone you know who's really in, i mean it's like joel yeah. versus me well roughly, i would uh, let know. me let me just say for the, the <laughs> public record that age is not does yeah, not have anything to do with this no, okay well um. okay well there is okay, not, <laughs> not age skill sets but yeah i well, think that, i think you can't make a correlation because if you haven't been brought up so I think the answer yeah, to the, the real sort of different differentiator is is kind of a willingness and a growth mindset and an interest in learning it. And you spoke directly to the capacity. And I know Dr. Castro could speak to this as well. But you know the, the board's commitment to getting ITSs into the classrooms, that having a full time ITS at each school, which is in this budget, really will be meaningful. It's something that our principals have been asking for to get us up to a place where we're full time in every school because those are the folks who do the day-to-day, side-by-side, job-embedded coaching, how to use technology, how to leverage all of the things that you were hearing teachers talk about in your classroom. So if you're uncomfortable and you're not quite sure how to do it, you can have somebody right there with you showing you how to do it and modeling those lessons um, right along with you and then building those plans for the whole school so that if one teacher really loves using Flipgrid and the ITS knows how to use Flipgrid and that teacher and the ITS are talking about it with other teachers and they say, oh, I want to try that, then go right into the classroom with them and help them try it and help design a lesson plan that allow them to incorporate that technology into their into their <laughs> teaching. Amy, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. I was going to mention very much, you're absolutely right, every teacher is at a different um, level and we want to make sure that we're respectful, respectful of that and the ITSs are really the first line of service in the building and it's been um, wonderful having them um, able to go into grade level planning and help introduce teachers to different applications and material or um, actually go in and model lessons and co-teach you know we moved away from that computer lab model where it was the computer resource teacher sit you know a, a teacher would drop off a class in the computer lab kind of thing to where there's a co-instruction going on co-planning going on coaching modeling um, and that's really something that has made a difference and why you probably heard an awful lot of folks um, begging to get full-time ITS's in the buildings where they had part-time ITS's because they know the power of that coaching model and I didn't get an opportunity to thank our 
instructional technology team because they kept stepping out, but they're in the doorway, so I'm going to ask them to step in. <laughs> Bill Johnson, our director of instructional technology. I see a few of our instructional technology coordinators outside as well. And I will and, say that we have some I yeah. ITSs from the schools that were here today. Uh, if you can kind of shake your hand. Uh, yes, you. so there you go. <laughs> there, there's a lot of magic happens, happens really in the building. Our instructional technology quarters, coordinators and the ITSs in every building are really working to provide that support and professional development for teachers. Mrs. Roth? Mine was a quick comment. I first heard about digital citizenship from one of the elementary principals. So um, I think it's wonderful, and I, I think I, I can't wait to see the fruits of these labors when these kids hit <coughs> middle school. That's my hope, that this will all pay off by the time they hit that grade level in particular. Okay. Thank you. Some of the students could actually become some of our ITSs for all of us around the table here. <laughs> One, one class that I went into, one of the elementary kids, I mean, he was going around helping everybody. And it was like, right. it was like a little tech. Yeah. Yeah, little children. Yeah, <laughs> little children. <laughs> Which I haven't watched, but I've seen it. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyone that knows the digital creators Okay. So, okay. We've we've, uh, we've we've let the crowd go. Let, in the interest of time, let's uh, go. Keep, are we good to keep pushing? Yeah. So let's go. Yeah. yeah. We're perfectly set up by the last teacher and student who alluded to Schoology. So Donald. Yep. So good afternoon, Chairwoman Anderson, and Vice Chair McDonald, members of the board, Dr. Spence. Uh, this today's presentation. <laughs> We'll provide an overview of Schoology's implementation to date and next steps for expansion to all schools in the division. So what is Schoology? Simply put, Schoology is a learning management system. It supports delivery of instruction and assessment. It enables communication. It houses digital resources, tools, and instructional resources. and creates opportunities for student-centered and flexible approaches to teaching and learning. In support of the goals, specifically goals one and two of Compass to 2020, the use of a learning management system was identified as a key strategy that will help create a classroom environment highly conducive to teaching and learning. As technology resources continue to evolve, and in conjunction with meeting the goals of Compass to 2020, we felt that a learning management system, heretofore referred to as an LMS, could assist us in creating a smoother transition to personalized learning. An LMS would provide a streamlined, user-friendly application for interacting with and accessing teaching and learning content, assessments, and reporting. A LMS reduces touch points for teachers, students, and parents when interacting with the school division's digital content, serving as a single destination for teaching and learning information. As you can see from the bullets on this slide, we believe it imperative to investigate various learning management systems to identify one that can meet all of our needs. The process to find and select the LMS was collaborative, strategic, and time consuming. The five departments noted on this slide spent well over one year reviewing LMSs, speaking with key staff from other school divisions and thought leaders in the technology arena, and observing an LMS in action in two <coughs> school divisions. As a result, we decided to take the additional step of creating an RFI or request for information 
first as a means to ensure due diligence, using this information to then create a focused and thorough RFP process. In the RFP process, we included school administrators and teachers in all presentations from prospective vendors, using their input and feedback and helping us to narrow and eventually make our selection of Schoology. This level of collaboration continues in the form of weekly conference calls across departments, regular monthly project implementation meetings with Schoology staff and key staff from each of the departments, as well as specific work groups from each department focusing on issues such as curriculum development, assessment, data reporting, technology, infrastructure, and logistics, as well as communication planning. I'd like to take a moment to thank the representatives of these departments and embarrass them just for a moment and ask them to stand. Those of, of us in the city, in fact, I know, Kiva, you're looking at me like, really, i got to stand up? <laughs> yes. That have, that have helped us. It's a picture. It's a visual. It's collaborative. Yay. Come on. You've been in for a Yay. Don't ask to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> So as noted, uh, this process led us to select Schoology and to help staff make connections and understand how Schoology supports our work in Compass to 2020, we created several infographics. One of those is pictured on this slide. You, you also have additional documents uh, within your folders that uh, you can take a look at. What I'm really uh, instructing today when I looked at this document, it's been a while since I've looked at doc this document because we created it over a year ago. And as you will see in a moment, wow, we were pretty good. Because well, although we've allowed the process to um, uh, occur organically, we're, we're pretty much on schedule with the timeline from this particular document. But again, this is just one of several in your folder. And without taking additional time, if you have any questions about any of those documents in the folder, we can uh, refer to those in a moment. But this time, I want to turn it back over to Dr. Cashwell, who's going to show you a little bit more about the platform. All right, so how did we approach year one? We began really thinking about um, reimagining the teaching and learning content experiences we provide our students. So we didn't really want to pick up our existing curriculum, which is currently housed in SharePoint, Word documents, and dump them into Schoology. So we knew that was not the aim here. We really wanted to rethink the way we provided materials for teachers to ease their planning um, and the way we would be able to provide students an opportunity to interact with the content and the curriculum in a more meaningful way. So before um, we go deeply into what that looks like within Schoology, I think it's best for you, again, to hear from teachers and students instead of bringing them. I have a short video for you. Um, these um, are students and teachers who participated in the Schoology field test this year, explaining what Schoology is in their own words and how they've used it. We use Schoology as our go-to point if we want to get to a site really fast. Oh, this is a, this is your assignment to Schoology. Please go to that and then boom, you're there. All your assignments would be there as soon as you click it. So really, there's no stress. So a learning management system is almost like a, a digital binder for students. Um, it's a place where all of their assignments, all of their tests, all of everything can be kept that students can go back and look at at any time. The first thought is it's a one-stop shop. It's basically their textbook for my class. It's their notebook where they keep their assignments. It's where they can email me with questions. They can check grades on assignments that they've submitted. When they're absent, it's their absentee work. They go into the folder and everything we've done there is right there. So it's kind of everything all rolled up into one. If I have assignments for my students, I put them there. If I have articles or videos that I want them to look at, I can put them there. I put things on their calendar so that when they open it up, they see not only my assignments, but all of their other classes where teachers have loaded everything. So it allows them to be more organized. It allows me to be more organized because everything they need is right on the Schoology platform. You could go into the Schoology and see if you have anything missing or upcoming assignments. So you could go ahead and get prepared for it. And so you could potentially be ahead of the whole class. 
It helps me have honest, authentic learning. For example, I was an AVID and we were learning about micro scholarships and I found that a lot of my students didn't know what it was and I had made the assumption they did. So I was able to load an article from Forbes right then and there and push it through to all my students. It saved so much time in the classroom, but we were able to have that authentic moment. Whereas had I not had access to this, it might have been something I would do the next class or the following week, but it wouldn't have had that direct impact, that learning moment. Usually every time I walk into a classroom, my teacher will tell me that um, your warm-up is in Schoology and I'll immediately know what to do because there's always an agenda there. Mainly because there's also a calendar so we can see what dates that the assignments were put in there and it's easier for me because I always know automatically what to do in the classroom when I walk in. We've recently done a um, research project in Colonial Williamsburg and instead of the students searching for different sites or going on Google and just looking for sites, I found the sites that I knew that they were going to be the most helpful and most appropriate for the students and I created a space where they could just click on those links and find what they needed instead of spending the majority of their research time just finding a link for their particular topic. I love Schoology. I don't always do well with change, especially when it comes to the technical world, but I think this has been such a great change. The kids respond really well to it. With everyone using it, it provides a very consistent platform, and I think that's one of the reasons that the teachers and the students have had so much success as a whole. We've really adopted it well in the building. So in the um, presentation prior, you saw a lot of reference to a variety of different platforms and most using Google to organize things. Um, but what Google can't do, though it can serve very much in that organizational format for student, between the student and the teacher, it doesn't house curriculum and assessments um, and streamline the process even more, as Dr. Robertson alluded to. So let's take a look inside of Schoology. At the elementary level, teachers can access their curriculum resources through group pages created by the Department of Teaching and Learning. Teachers then pull the resources that they wish to use along with any other resources or materials they might want to bring in into their courses by creating assignments, pages, or uploading files. On the screen, you can see a task that an elementary teacher has assigned to a student from a student's perspective. Here, a student is about to begin a performance task launched by his teacher. The teacher is using a Department of Teaching and Learning created interest survey to assist in guiding students through instruction for their Earth, um, Moon, and Sun unit. Here you can see a second grader's view inside of Schoology and the activities that his teacher has launched for him around their science unit as again pulled from a Department of Teaching and Learning curriculum resource. Notice here that students are provided with a distinct sequence of learning activities which allow them to explore and interact with content. Students are often provided a variety of options or learning activities through hyperlinks that allow them to engage in learning and explore concepts. As students submit their work in Schoology, teachers and students can be mindful of performance criteria through rubrics, which enable timely feedback. Here's an example of a rubric that accompanied a task within the elementary curriculum. The teacher can then score right within a drop down and provide standards aligned feedback to the student within Schoology. Notice in what you've seen from these elementary curriculum snapshots in Schoology that it's not just curriculum that's traditional in a digitized format, but a, rather it's really a way to create experiences to engage students more deeply in learning and see content that's personalized not only to their interests but their academic level in a way that <coughs> enables timely feedback between the student and the teacher. Here's a sample from a secondary earth science course, which shows how teachers are provided groups based on the content they're teaching. For example, all science groups are set up this way. There is a teacher resources folder that contains all of the curriculum documents, such as unit guides and pacing guides and alignment documents. And just as you saw in the elementary <laughs> example, a teacher would then pull resources into their own course, and then from that course, they would push it into to the students that are enrolled in that course to meet individual or class needs. Students have a view of each course in which they're enrolled. So for example, in Google Classroom, some teachers may use it, some not. You'd need a unique code. You'd need a unique code to log into each Google Classroom. <coughs> With Schoology, when the school is using it, it's one platform in which you would see every class that you're enrolled. So um, 
Here you can see an example of what a student would see, for example, in his English 10 course. For this unit, the teacher has shared resources with all students and then also has assigned some individual tasks. Tasks can be, again, assigned individually to groups or the whole class. And notice on the right the student's calendar, which shows all of the upcoming due dates. Just as you saw in the elementary example, rubrics can be leveraged to guide students and assist teachers in providing timely feedback. Note in the red box the feedback loop between the student and the teacher, almost in a chat fashion there, back and forth. Using the assessment platform in Schoology, teachers have the tools to create classroom assessments with 15 different item types. They can use multiple choice, fill in the blank, charts, number lines, and labeling to meet the needs of their class. In the managed assessments platform in Schoology, also known as AMP, there's, um, this allows for collaboration between staff on the creation of assessments that are intended to be administered school-wide or district-wide through assessment teams. Assessment teams have been created for each school and for each curriculum group to facilitate this collaboration. For the managed assessments through AMP, staff have access to reports including individual item performance, overall student results, and standards mastery. You can imagine that interacting with content through a learning management system is different, um, particularly for students, but as mentioned, um, also for teachers. And so we recognize that support is needed when, whenever we're facilitating something new in our classrooms. So to, to support both the students and the teachers within our field test schools this year, we offered a variety of supports. Last spring, before school even let out, all anchor school teachers were provided an online overview course on Schoology, which they could access as many times as they wanted to and at their own pace, sort of a self-paced overview. And then later that summer, each school, each anchor school sent a team of Schoology champions, as they're called, um, to more specific hands-on in-person training. And then those champions returned to the school buildings ready to work with the, with the whole faculty and staff, sort of in a train the trainer model beginning during that teacher in-service week and then throughout the year. And then to really support the anchor school um, schools as a community so they could learn not only within their own schools but from others. Um, we had a group within Schoology that was an online group for the Schoology champions and it was fun to monitor that because they'd ask each other questions and post and while division staff monitored that, our instructional technology coordinators, our staff in teaching and learning, secondary and elementary could answer their questions or provide advice, they were often providing each other great advice. And then we had face-to-face -face, um, meetings once a month with the digital learning anchor teams, their leadership teams, again, to share best practices and ideas and provide additional support. Um, but we really found from working with them hands-on that the, the use of the application is fairly intuitive, but to get the most out of it, it was really beneficial to, to leverage that um, professional development, but certainly really have come up with ways to keep that ongoing conversation for professional support. So as I mentioned, using the application itself might be more intuitive or really mastering the technical, if you will, but we don't want our teachers just to stop there. It's one thing to learn how to log on to Schoology um, and, and maybe place some assignments to students, but what can you really do to maximize that experience? Because that's the whole point, to really create those transformational experiences for students. So we really worked with our schools, again, through those face-to-face -face meetings and in all of the materials we provided them to help them keep in mind what we were aiming for. So one of the documents that we put together and that you have in your folder, we won't spend a long time on it, but just that for example, um, if you find this document, you can see that we use this to kind of help outline what basic use would be and honor that that's okay. In year one, if you're um, you know simply on the left column, that's okay. These are some things you'd really want to master as you're getting your toes in the water, if you will, with Schoology. But what could it look like? What might you aim for? So, you know, you might start out by creating experiences where you're just adding files and links, but then eventually what does that look like when you set up that feedback loop with students? And eventually what does that look like um, when um, you are accessing maybe analytics from assessments that you were giving rather than just giving the assessment that way? So really wanted to help um, again, honor that every teacher learns at his or her own pace, but help them see that transformational end game, if you will. And then we have um, provided professional <coughs> learning in regard to every one of these topics. And there are some great modules where they can click on and get help right here if they don't know how to do those things um, or leverage other supports as well. 
Similarly, um, we worked with the leaders in our anchor schools to develop a document um, sort of that helped the leaders within the um, school think about how they might leverage school. You heard a great example from Mr. Furlick who was sharing um, you know, that he actually looks into the Google Classroom to see some of the conversations that happen in regard to goal setting so that he can make personal connections to students. So just because the school administrators or staff that may not be assigned a, a classroom of their own doesn't mean they don't interact with Schoology. So what does it look like from a leadership perspective to leverage Schoology? How can you leverage it for providing professional development to your teachers as a leader, for facilitating group meetings and planning? So. Um, our anchor school leaders were wonderful in helping brainstorm, again, how we could use this tool productively and to create um, collaborative experiences and then work to create this document, again, to help our leaders work through um, how they might best leverage the tool. All right, and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Robertson. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. So over the past year, we have listened, learned, and supported our anchor schools. Their work interacting with the LMS and providing critical feedback on the system itself and the implementation plan shapes where we are today. To determine the successes and challenges of implementation for staff and students, the Office of Research and Evaluation collaboratively developed and deployed surveys. Data analysis indicated or impacted decision making at the anchor sites and shaped decision level choices on enhancing features in Schoology as well as helping to shape potential division expansion plans. While you heard from teachers and students in the opening video about their perceptions of how Schoology has transformed the teaching and learning experience, I would like to share a bit of the data from our teacher survey. At, at this point, we have completed a fall and a winter survey, with only the final spring survey window yet to go. Survey results are used not only to help us learn about Schoology, but to also determine areas that need support as we assist schools with implementation. Here you can see that between the fall and winter teacher surveys, teachers have shown growth in some of the key instructional elements related to Schoology use. Learning how to use the basics of Schoology, as Dr. Cashwell mentioned, is intuitive and comes more easily to users. Moving from the technical to transformational use requires more practice as it's not just about learning to implement a new tool, but rather how to best leverage the tool to enhance instruction and personalized learning. Anchor schools experiences, combined with the data from students, administrators, and teachers has shaped our approach for moving into next year and helped us to form a solid plan for supporting schools. As we move into year two, providing schools flexibility and honoring their readiness was and still is very important. This past January, we invited all teachers to get to know Schoology through an overview course and also asked principals to collaborate with their school leadership teams to determine if they wanted to roster students next year to begin to fully leverage Schoology with students or if they wanted another year before making the full transition into creating Schoology experiences for their students. Given the option to consider how they would prefer to move forward. All schools chose to roster their students, recognizing that they would still be offered flexibility and support regarding the need, the speed at which they would fully implement Schoology across their schools. Some schools have teachers ready to go, while in other schools exploration will take place in certain grade levels and content areas where the teachers are most ready for the next step. This will allow power users in schools to spread knowledge and expertise at a pace that honors teachers' varying readiness levels, but positions everyone for full use by the 2019-20 school year. The fact that all schools chose to take a big step into exploring Schoology with their students next year indicates the strong desire and willingness for schools to transform experiences for, for students. As a result, we will again provide flexible, differentiated support for schools replicating and improving the professional learning structure that was provided to our anchor schools. Here you see a mapping of support to be offered at our schools who will begin using Schoology for the next time next year, for the first time next year. As mentioned previously, teachers have already been provided access to the overview course which they can go back and revisit. Schools will identify champions who will attend a session 
between April and June at their choosing. Champions will support their staff in moving forward at each site through site-based professional learning starting during Teacher Work Week and offered throughout the year next year. Students will be provided an overview course made for them by Anchor School students. And of course, our Anchor Schools will continue to receive support as needed. So let me take a moment to share how our students have been involved, not only with creating the for students, by students, Schoology 101 course, but in supporting the transition to digital devices in our schools. In some of our high schools, students have the opportunity to enroll in an independent study course to serve as help desk students. These students will then be equipped to provide first level support for Schoology and the devices themselves. Upon completing this course, all students will be able to participate in the discussion, connect their Google Drive, submit an assignment, unsummit an assignment, locate a returned Google Drive assignment in their Google Drive, access and create personal resources and collections, and join a group. In addition to support for teachers at each site by the School of the Champion, there are lots <laughs> of opportunities at the division level for teachers to learn more. Summer Digital Learning Summit is one such example where sessions on Schoology for teachers <coughs> by teachers will be delivered. Teaching and Learning will also, beginning this summer, be offering a number of professional learning sessions for teachers in all content areas related to the effective use of Schoology in their content area. Monthly face-to-face -face meetings for school implementation teams to come together, collaborate, and learn will also be offered and hostess hosted by the Department of Teaching and Learning. Real-time support through the Champions Group Discussion Board and Schoology as well as the Division's Schoology support page will be monitored by the, by the ITCs and other central support members from all departments. So you can see that the implementation was and is collaborative, input-driven process, and we are pleased to be able to utilize Schoology across the Division in a way that honors the individual needs of schools but keeps us on pace to meeting our goals of Compass of 2020. That concludes the presentation. We're available for questions. Ms. Holtz. I would add before we take questions also, just that we didn't want to um, take more time today to get you into Schoology, but if you'd like <coughs> to actually get inside Schoology and play around with it a bit, we're offering two times for you to come um, and join us here in the Einstein Lab. If you just let us know whether you'll be here or not by RSVPing, we'd be happy to host you. Um, and then if you don't have the opportunity to join either of those events, the next time we present an update in the fall, once we get all our schools on board, we'll make sure we provide an opportunity as well. So I just wanted to let you know before we take questions. Thank you. Ms. Holtz? Oh, um, at the convention last week, there were many vendors there, and le uh, learning management systems were a big deal. I'm, I must have, they must have had a dozen there. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones that I explored, they were all subscription-driven. Is, is that what we have here, Schoology? Yeah, Schoology will be a cost by state. Oh, and what do you, you pay, like for a year, over a three year period or something? It depends on how you uh, develop the contract. Oh, and would Google Drive be the same? Okay. Subscription? Uh, Google is a free tool online, but it doesn't do what a learning management system does. I, I have. Oh, I know, to, I know that. Yeah, so in other words, um, you can't pull curriculum into there or district assessments or right. um, create any of those opportunities where students, so for example, within Schoology, a teacher may be scoring an assignment that would pass back into our Synergy gradebook. Those kinds of things wouldn't be possible with free tools or resources. Right. So just as you saw a lot of teachers having to use a variety of different ways that they share feedback with parents or create a Google Classroom, this streamlines that under a management system, which is a product. And you can link yes. to Google Drive through that. You absolutely yeah. can. To the, okay, thank you. To, to the fiscal question, so in the budget, you probably saw that there was a cost, several hundred thousand dollar cost for Schoology embedded in the budget. And I did get a question about that during the budget process. And I can't remember if I answered it for the one board member, if we sent that answer to all of you, but this is replacing some other systems and so the ultimate goal will be to use existing dollars for SchoolNet in particular phase SchoolNet out after next year and it'll be the same cost I mean roughly equivalent cost so it will have a little bit extra cost this school year of, let's say a little bit it's a significant average a couple hundred thousand dollars um, this school year coming up that was in the budget and then after that we'll phase SchoolNet out and we'll recuperate those costs and actually end up uh, saving some of those operating dollars that are going to be putting for the next school year. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just, uh, I know you all want to go grab dinner. Can I just say very quickly, Amy and Don, I, I, uh, board members, I hope you know um, and recognize what you saw tonight as far as uh, this piece in particular, but also the other piece, how uh, thorough and thoughtful the work that's gone into this has, has been. You, you heard it was a year-long process. Mm -hmm. It was a, a wide-ranging group of people who have been engaged in very deep conversations about making sure that if and when we engage with the learning management system, mm -hmm. that we are going to be meeting the needs of our teachers and the instructional needs for our students. And um, in very measured, thoughtful steps being taken to do that. We're not, you know, a lot of school divisions make the mistake of just investing in an LMS without a lot of thought. They hear it, it sounds great, let's get it. And they dump it on their teachers' heads and everybody's trying to figure out what do we do with this thing? And we've taken a measured approach to say we're gonna put it into our anchor schools, give them a lot of training in advance, work through the kinks, figure out what that looks like, invite schools into the process for the following year. So I just want to commend the team, everybody that was involved. Yeah, thank you. Um, really outstanding work on their part. I think that the biggest thing that I, that I was most impressed with is that you are asking for people to step up and become leaders within their schools and to help train other teachers. And I think that's, that's an awesome way to get started with this instead of just telling everybody, you have to do this, you got to get on board this year. We're not doing that. We're, we recognize that there are different levels that people learn, and, and I like that, that we're actually developing leaders within our schools. Thank you. Since, since students are viewing this, parents can view it too, right? There'll be a parent view piece oh, as well, good, I guess. Good. And we'll know what's going on. Yeah, they'll be able to see student <laughs> assignments, student attendance, things yeah, like that. That's great. Yeah.